In a remote northern city, a 52-year-old nurse goes missing from her home. My gut's screaming. And I said, somebody else has done things in here. Who might have kidnapped her and why? It was sickening to think about. To track her abductor, investigators use every forensic tool available. But the vicious assailant remains at large. You just want to reach out and get hold of the guy. He was trying to lure her into the car. I just got shivers up and down my spine. Will the monster who'd killed before kill again? Anchorage, Alaska, the largest community north of the 60th parallel is, in many ways, still a frontier town. A place that appeals to those in search of adventure, like 52-year-old Mindy Schloss. Mindy was a very strong woman. She was very independent. Mindy had moved to Alaska in the 1980s for what was supposed to be a short stay. More than 20 years later, she's still here and working as a psychiatric nurse. My relationship with Mindy actually started uh, as a co-worker. We were both employed as nurses. And we traveled around the States. Jerry couldn't ask for a better workmate. Mindy was very professional. She was very timely. If you weren't five minutes early for a meeting, you were late. She was very responsible. As far as a work ethic, most people give 100%, Mindy gave 110. It wasn't long before Mindy and Jerry became best friends. She would sometimes call me mom. And it was because of the closeness that we sort of took care of each other. And when Mindy took the hour-long flight from Anchorage to Fairbanks twice a month for work, Jerry took care of Mindy's cat. Willie required medication. So when Mindy was gone, I would go over every day and give Willie his medicine. The first week of August 2007 wasn't supposed to be any different. I was expecting to get with Mindy before she left for Fairbanks, but I called Saturday and I left a message and she didn't call back. And so I sort of thought, well, she's busy doing things and getting ready to go. Jerry continues to try and get in touch with Mindy all weekend, and she's not the only one. Mindy's longtime friend, Bob Conway, has also been trying to reach her. I called her cell phone and I got to the voicemail box was full. And that just never happened. That's when I, when I contacted Jerry. He asked if I had heard from Mindy, and I said no, and she hadn't returned his calls. And that alarmed both of us, because of all the people in Mindy's world, she kept in touch with the two of us more than anyone. I knew there was something really wrong. I didn't know which way to turn. I didn't know what to think. You don't know where to begin. You don't know where to look. Early the following morning, Jerry heads over to Mindy's to feed the cat and have a look around the house. She's concerned by what she sees. Mindy was very orderly. She was a little bit almost compulsive about how she liked her house to be and look. And basically, the house looked as if she'd walked out the door and hadn't got ready for the week. Jerry heads downstairs to give Willie his medication. But as she's leaving, the door was extremely loose, so I got a screwdriver and tightened up the doorknob and shut it and locked it and went to work. When Jerry gets to her office, she places a call to Fairbanks. And her supervisor came on the phone and she said, Jerry, I'm a little concerned. Mindy didn't show up for work this morning. That hit my button. So much so, she contacts police. I was driving home and my sergeant called and said that there was a suspicious missing person case and asked if I could come back into the station and take a look at the case. It isn't long before Pam is doing a walkthrough with Jerry of Mindy's home. To me, the house did not look unusual. There was no sign whatsoever of burglary. She was a traveling nurse, and so she went out to the villages, and she had just beautiful carvings in her home, things that were, you know, worth quite a bit of money. And as a nurse practitioner... She had medication in the house that would have been desirable to somebody that broke in. She had prescription pads. None of it had been touched. It just didn't look like somebody had come in 
to the home or that less struggle had happened in the home. But it's the small things that have caught Jerry's attention. Well, there were a bunch of bills on the table that were half made out. There was an empty bottle of wine sitting on the kitchen counter. And when I walked into the bedroom, the bed was clean, made, really tight, needy corners. And anybody that knows Mindy knows Mindy would not have her bed that way. Mindy was a restless sleeper. She never tucked anything in. Jerry pointed out many things that were unusual in the house. At that point, we looked in the garage and the car was gone. And I said, Mindy would never drive her car. She lived so close to the airport and there was no reason for her to park uh, in storage. She would always catch a taxi to uh, the airport when she'd leave. Jerry's intuition was telling her loud and clear things weren't right and i said somebody else has done things in here had mindy opened her door to a ruthless abductor she told her friend she felt uncomfortable around him that she thought he was creepy and he was actually the last person to see mindy alive 52 year old anchorage psychiatric nurse mindy schloss hasn't been heard from for days i felt something horrible and it happened to mindy and we just didn't know what while the forensic team uses tape lifts to trap evidence left by the one who may have abducted her, Detective Pam Bernou turns her attention to Bob Conway, Mindy's on-again, off-again boyfriend. Could he be responsible for her disappearance? To try and find out where Bob Conway was for sure, we contacted his place of employment and got his work records, what times he was working. You know, I wasn't really happy they were looking at me. But I knew they were pursuing every angle, so I guess in a way you're, you're thankful a little bit for that. But Detective Pernu is able to confirm that Bob was out of town when Mindy vanished. But might she have been seeing someone else? Mindy would do um, online dating, and so occasionally she would have a date through that. Pernu takes a close look at Mindy's most recent computer activities. Although she finds no evidence of online dating, Pernu can see when Mindy last accessed the internet. We knew it was Mindy on her computer because we could look to see the different sites that she was going on and sites that um, were related to nursing. So we could put her at her house on the internet up until 1.30 a.m. on August 4th. What happened to Mindy after that? In the hopes that someone may have seen her or her vehicle, police distribute photos of both to local TV outlets. There were a lot of people calling in saying that they had seen Mindy in different places. A Fred Meyer store in Eagle River, some as far away as Texas. Will any of them turn out to be true? Detectives were trying to follow up every single tip that came in. So we just needed a lot of people. Anchorage police appeal to the FBI's special agent, Michael Thorson, for help. So you have to try to determine maybe did they plan a trip? So taking a look at transactions on a credit card, did she go to Walmart and buy a tent? Try to identify maybe if she was planning on something and just didn't tell anybody. But investigators find no indication Mindy had any plans to leave town. I never thought that she had just gone somewhere else. I didn't know if she was sick or hurt or in the hospital somewhere. I started thinking in my mind, had she gone out Sunday doing something, walking, hiking, berry picking? If she passed out, the potential is, could have she fallen and hit her head? Either a bear got her or she's lost or something. So, I mean, I immediately contacted some fellow workers that were down in that neighborhood, and they, sh they shut the job down and went and combed the whole Seward Highway that very afternoon. But when they find no sign of her, Bob Conway grows increasingly worried that something sinister has happened to Mindy, and he's determined to find out what. Drove rivers, looked through ditches, and looked through dumpsters. I mean, I just, I did, it's just horrible. And while police do a search of Mindy's neighborhood. I called Mindy's bank, and I asked them if there was any unusual activity on Mindy's debit card. The answer is yes there was a large cash withdrawal at an early morning hour, which was not typical for Mindy. Investigators request the bank's surveillance tape and are distressed to see a masked man accessing her account. He has a bandana on, has a quilted jacket. He performs a balance inquiry. Then he puts his hand up to his face and pulls down the bandana. 
just long enough for him to be able to type in, see whatever he needs to see. They can see basically from his nose down to his chin. Could this split second glimpse help lead police to the masked man? And then we see him gets the money, turn around and exit. And at that time, we can definitely see he is wearing a backpack. This is something that we definitely would be able to identify if we can find it again. Are there other clues the investigators can glean? On that particular day, being in the um, first part of August, it still would have been 60s in Alaska, and people people in Alaska 60s is, is, is 100 degrees in Phoenix. And the person had a very large jacket on, would have been described as a winter quilted jacket. Again, he's trying to hide his body frame. Who is this man, and what's his involvement in Mindy Schloss's disappearance? I thought, well, I'll gather Mindy's friends and show them this photo. I, when I saw that guy, I got a very sickening feeling. I just got shivers up and down my spine. But none of Mindy's friends could identify the man. Could Mindy's activities in the days prior to her disappearance offer investigators a clue? I found out from one of her friends that Mindy was having work done in her home. So she was calling in contractors to give her quotes. Mindy got into an argument with one of the contractors about his price, and she told her friends she felt uncomfortable around him, that she thought he was creepy. Investigators tracked the man down, but he comes up clean. Pernu then questions another contractor who'd met with Mindy Schloss the very night she went missing. It was about 7 p.m. that he was there, and he was extremely nervous about talking to us. But his story, too, checks out. We didn't find out anything unusual in his past, and he didn't see anybody else at Mindy's home when he was there. Will a new ATM video lead investigators to Mindy's real abductor? Our worst fears were confirmed at that point. I knew that she was probably dead. It's been 48 hours since Anchorage resident Mindy Schloss was reported missing, and four days since anyone has heard from her. Now investigators have learned of a second withdrawal from her bank account made in the early morning hours. The video was good enough that we can see what appears to be the same exact jacket that he had on the first ATM withdrawal. Again, wearing a bandana, but interesting with that one, looking at the video, we see him, again, perform the balance inquiry, withdraws the maximum amount of $500 that you can do each day, and he walks out. Well, not a few minutes later, he walks back into the lobby, goes back up to the ATM machine. He looked very agitated, walking around, tugging on the bandana, arranging his clothes. What could have happened to so upset him? And so I contacted the security officer for that bank. I asked him to take a look at the machine. He took a look at the machine and found a card. Sure enough, that card belonged to Mindy Schloss. The man had forgotten the card when he left, and the machine, for security's sake, had swallowed it up again. So he walked back in, and of course, I'm now thinking he's trying everything he can possibly do. He's frantic at this point, because it's not like he can show up at the bank and say, I lost my card when his name's not Mindy Schloss. If the first withdrawal hadn't convinced Pam Pernu of Mindy's fate, the second withdrawal has. I knew that she was probably dead. Can investigators determine who may have killed her without tipping their hand by releasing their surveillance photo to the general public? So I went to the bank and I asked for all the transactions before and after his, hoping maybe we might have a witness that saw a car leaving, may be able to give us a good description on a car that we can try to hunt down the possible suspect here. Will police, for the first time in this investigation, get lucky? We had a person who, at you know 4.30 in the morning, he decided that he needed to use the ATM machine. And when he drove up, he saw a man outside. What was interesting is he said this male was on a bicycle. Might the bike be a clue to the man's identity? Police canvass Mindy's neighborhood again in search of anything that will lead them to her or her abductor. When was the last time you saw your neighbor Mindy? What do you know about her? And then asking them, is there a house in the neighborhood 
that there are problems with. One house that kept that coming up a little bit strange was the house right next to Mindy Schloss's house. The neighbors would just say, there are parties all the time. It is a problem house for this neighborhood. Investigators pay a visit to the home. There was a number of people living there, younger people, and they didn't want to provide a lot of information. Pernu then speaks to the woman who lives on the opposite side of the problem house. I felt that she was holding something back. I thought, you know, she seems like a very, a very good person, and she just isn't answering the question. Does the woman know something about Mindy's disappearance? And if so, why won't she say? The next day I got a call from her, and she said that she had more information that she would like to give me, but she did not want me to come to her home, that she was afraid. So I went to meet her at work, and what she told me was that before we got to her house that evening, a man that lived in the house next door came over to her residence. She said that she knew him as Josh. And when he came over, he said to her, the police are in the neighborhood now. And he said, I do not want you to tell them that I live here. And she asked him why. You know, He said, because he was on probation and that he did not want to get arrested. The woman didn't mention him to police that day, but later that night, home alone. She heard somebody walking around on her porch. So she snuck through the house, went and looked out a window just in time to see Josh. And she said that scared her. So much so. She finally relents and tells us his last name. And she says, it's Joshua Waite. I immediately recognized his name. Joshua Waite is infamous for any law enforcement officer in the state of Alaska because of his acquittal of a murder in which a Alaska native was brutally murdered and beat with a rock to death. It was a horrible murder. But because Wade could be charged only with evidence tampering in Della Brown's death... He had served a very short time in prison and that he had been released. But I was convinced from what I knew that he had murdered Della Brown and gotten away with it. Even though 12 people said I was not guilty, everybody thinks I'm guilty. Is he also guilty of abducting, maybe even killing, Mindy Schloss? Investigators mount an all-out search for the now free 27-year-old. From the information that we were getting from the roommates, which wasn't much, we didn't think that he had a car. They told us that he traveled mostly by bike or he walked, and they just claimed that they hadn't seen him lately. Those who have seen him fear he's hiding something terrible like the mother of Christina Greaser, one of Josh's friends. My first impression when my daughter walked in with Josh into my home was I was very angry. Given his past history, from what my daughter had told me that he was a neighbor of Mindy's, I, I felt very nervous, very scared. I was concerned about him lashing out and doing something to somebody else. Can scent dogs, despite the odds, track down the could-be killer? In this case, we were weeks old. You have traffic, you have cars, you have wind, you have everything that's destroying that scent. Investigators are distraught to learn that 27-year-old Joshua Wade, acquitted seven years earlier for the savage murder of Della Brown, is living in a house next door to missing Anchorage nurse Mindy Schloss. It would have been ridiculous of me to not immediately think that Josh Wade had something to do with Mindy's disappearance. We need to get him off the street and do what we can to build a case against Josh Wade. And on August 9th, one week after Mindy Schloss and her vehicle were last seen, police get a call from an observant local truck driver. And he told me when he was out at the airport, he drove by and he saw the, the back end of a car that looked like Mindy's to him. And he said, I was going to just drive on past, but I thought, no, I better back up and take another look. And he backed up, and he said he saw the license plate, and he said he just started shaking. Sure enough, it's Mindy's car. And it was very strange, because it was approximately about a mile away from the airport. There would be no reason why Mindy would park her car in that lot if she was going to go on a trip somewhere. Police on the scene search the car, but find no sign of Mindy. But we go and we see that there's video cameras. 
there in the, in the parking lot. So we reviewed the video and we saw what looked to be a man driving Mindy's car in about 12.45 on August 4th, uh, parking the car. Gets out, shuts the door, looks like he's wiping down the car for fingerprints, and then you see him walking away. As he's walking away, it looks to be a male wearing a backpack. Can't quite determine it, but it sure looks like that same backpack that was used at that first ATM transaction at Wells Fargo. Is this the man who abducted Mindy? And if it is Josh Wade, had he left any proof of that behind? We need to do whatever we can to try to determine if there's any evidence in that car. The crime scene team took swabs from the steering wheel and the gear shift, uh, checking for DNA, and processed the car for fingerprints. Inside the car, there was a shoe impression that was found in dirt, all kind of sideways, like someone who was laying in the car. Investigators are all but certain that passenger was Mindy. We find Mindy Sloss's purse. I go through the purse. Her ATM card's missing. In addition to the physical evidence found at the scene, investigators search for the less tangible using a scent transfer machine. It's a small vacuum cleaner type device. It can collect scent off a hard surface like a steering wheel or a, uh, the stick shift in the car places that the individual that was driving Mindy's car would have touched. The forensic team pays particular attention to the driver's seat. Because we wanted to isolate scent from the subject versus passengers that had been in the car. Armed now with the abductor's scent, the FBI calls in the canines. I was very skeptical of the scent dogs and what they were telling me that they could do. Including tracking the man who used Mindy Schloss's bank card from this ATM to wherever his scent leads them. Even Michael Thorson is hedging his bets. Let's go ahead and try, but we weren't holding our breath. Tracking dogs are typically used immediately after a crime. So for example, in a bank robbery, they're going to follow scent immediately after from that location. Not only was this trail weeks old. You have traffic, you have cars, you have wind, you have everything that's destroying that scent and for that scent to still be on the ground. The tracking dog was presented with scent at the ATM, and it was a scent taken from Mindy's car. That dog then walked out, walked down the street, about three and a half blocks, walked over to Mindy's house. And went up the front steps of Mindy's house and sniffed at the door handle and on the stairs, and then came down the stairs uh, and went around the fence to the house immediately next to Mindy's house. The home of investigators' number one suspect, Josh Wade. The dog then provides its signal and says, I'm telling you, this is where the scent leads. I was pretty shocked. The first thing I did was call Detective Pernu on the phone. When Jolene called me and told me what the dog had done, I couldn't believe it. I wanted to see it for myself. Pam Pernu will soon get that chance when the FBI lets loose the scent dog at the second location where Mindy's bank card was used. He crosses one of the major intersections. APD cars are having to race ahead to stop traffic because the dog just doesn't stop. It ends up going almost three and a half miles through the middle of Anchorage City to Joshua Wade's house. It was just incredible. But catching Josh Wade will prove a lot more dangerous than police and the public could imagine. She said that on the phone, she went through the pictures and she saw a hand holding a gun. So I told her, you need to be very careful because I'm sure he's looking for you. Armed with a search warrant, investigators are closing in on the home of Josh Wade, their number one suspect in the abduction and probable murder of Mindy Schloss. And the SWAT team went into the residence because uh, Josh Wade is obviously considered very dangerous. Though the search team finds no sign of Josh Wade, they do find evidence they hope will help with the investigator's case. That included uh, a jacket that appeared to match the jacket that the individual at the ATM wore. So when I took it over to the lab, they then conducted in an examination of the jacket. They found a Credit Union One receipt a $500 withdrawal 
at the exact same time and place as the ATM withdrawal was done at the credit union one. I thought it was incredibly stupid that he left the receipt in the jacket that he wore to withdraw Mindy Schloss's money out of her account. Criminals make mistakes every single day, and that's why law enforcement was able to catch him. The SWAT team moves on in search of still more evidence of Wade's guilt. They went into this closet and noticed that there was a attic access. So as one officer is pushing the other officer up into the attic, he scrapes along the wall with his gear. They saw and heard something fall from the inside door jam of the closet. And a watch falls on the ground. And that happened to be a lady's watch. But does it belong to Mindy? As soon as I saw the watch, I called Jerry, Mindy's really good friend. She had described to me before some of the jewelry that Mindy wore. She's like a nurse like me. We're old school nurses, you know, you always wore a watch. Jerry told me that she knew the watch was gold. She said that Mindy was very small. She was a very petite woman, and so the circumference of the watch would be really small. We knew at that point then that Mindy was no longer alive. But can they finally find her body? It was very urgent. Pretty soon after that, it was going to start snowing, and we may never find it at that point. It's very, very difficult to prosecute somebody for a homicide if you don't have the body of the victim. Each minute, each day that goes on, evidence can get destroyed. Is Josh Wade destined to escape a murder conviction, just as he did in the death of Della Brown? Much will depend on the results of the DNA samples taken from the inside of Mindy Schloss's car. The state of Alaska, through the governor's office, actually put some pressure on to get this DNA done immediately. When we received the, the results from the state of Alaska lab, it confirmed that the DNA on the steering wheel was a match to Josh Wade. We immediately released to the public that we were looking for Josh Wade as a person of interest in the disappearance of Mindy Schloss. There were posters that were made, put all over town. Two major billboards are placed in Anchorage, providing reward for his arrest. Everybody in law enforcement was looking for Josh Wade. This was one of the biggest manhunts that we've had in Alaska. And investigators are feeling the pressure. I was pretty concerned about him lashing out and doing something to somebody else. There was a lot of fear, a lot of concern that he was uh, he was out in the community and that we didn't have him arrested. Police receive hundreds of tips from the public, but Wade continues to elude investigators. For the next week or so, we were just missing him. It was almost like a cat and mouse game. We were knocking on people's doors that knew him, that were associated with him, and it always seemed that he was here and he was close, but we were just always a couple of minutes behind him. We released the photograph that we had taken from the uh, bank at the ATM of Josh Wade wearing the hat and the bandana over his face. Although there is very little of his face visible, one woman is sure she knows him. Her name is Lisa, and she's an old girlfriend of Wade's. She said that she recognized the person in the ATM photo as Josh, but she wouldn't talk to us again after that. But there is another woman in Josh Wade's circle looking to come clean. Christina Greaser, who is about to provide police with their most promising tip yet. She called and she said that she had been driving him around um, over the past few weeks and that at some point he left a backpack in her car. When my daughter informed me that he left the backpack, we both started going through it. There was a lot of bank receipts. There was a cell phone in there. She said that on the phone, she went through the pictures and she saw a picture of a hand holding a gun. Christina said that she thought that that was Josh Wade's hand and that the gun looked like a gun that he, she had seen him with. A Glock 45 caliber handgun. Tina Greaser tells her daughter to contact police immediately. So she did. She came into the Anchorage Police Department and we got the backpack from her. But will she help police with their investigation? What we wanted her to do was to uh, participate in recording conversations between herself and Josh Wade. Afraid for her life, she refuses to cooperate further. 
when Christina stopped working with us, I told her, you need to be very careful. Um, you know, you he knows that you have that backpack, and you need to be very careful because I'm sure he's looking for you. The next thing I knew is my daughter had called me and said, Mom, Josh is outside my house. Can investigators catch Josh Wade before he kills again? He was literally moving from one person's house to the next, trying to stay ahead of law enforcement. The man police believe murdered Mindy Schloss has suddenly appeared at the home of Christina Greaser, demanding she return his backpack. He had a lot of anger in his voice, and he was also cursing at my daughter at that point. Wade insists Christina give him a ride somewhere safe from police, but she refuses to help him. She tried to get him to stick around, but he got suspicious and started walking away. And what my daughter did is she ended up getting in her vehicle and following Josh through the neighborhood. She had the direct number of one of the SWAT guys, so she called him directly and said, he's here, I can see him. The officers were close by, so they got into the area. To their dismay, however, Josh Wade has already found his way into a nearby apartment building. I drove down the highway basically as fast as is legally possible, and I arrive on the scene where he's at. Police officers are out with their shotguns. Everywhere you walk, there's a police officer. And I speak with the SWAT team leader who advises that currently he's in negotiations with Josh Wade because there are two people that he's holding hostage in this apartment. All we wanted to do was arrest him so that he couldn't hurt anybody else. So it was very frustrating. Will the man who has eluded police for weeks surrender? To the investigator's relief. Wade finally did give himself up. He opened up the door to the apartment. We took custody of him and then escorted him from the apartment to an awaiting police car. I was very happy, very relieved. And I just wanted to see if we could try and talk to him. But Wade will be a tough nut to crack. He knows the system. He knows the game. He has an attitude. I can see he's just going to tell me that he wants his lawyer and he just wants to go to jail. So knowing we only have one shot at this, I tell Pam, I said, let's go in. Hey, Josh. Hi, I'm Pam Pernu with APD. And we want to uh, let you know what's going on. We started to tell him why he was under arrest. You gonna talk with us at all? Or are you just gonna sit there? You gonna do the silent treatment? Do you wanna talk with us? About what? About uh, what you've been arrested for? I have no idea what I've been arrested for, man. You've been arrested for two counts of bank fraud, aggravated identity theft, and access device fraud. He says, well, what, what do you mean by the device fraud? <laughs> Is that? that is uh, bank fraud, which means that you used an uh, ATM card of somebody that's not yourself and that uh, that person did not give you permission to do so. And Josh says, you're assuming that. You guys assume all this? No, we don't assume. We have a little bit more than assume. I mean, we actually talked to Mindy, you know. She told us that you didn't have permission to use her ATM card. Hmm? There was that pregnant pause, and he had this, what I call a smirk. He had this little smile on his face. What did you just say? And you could see in his eyes, he was reliving what he did. He knew that we didn't talk to Mindy because he had killed her. Are you guys trying to play games with me, man? To me, it said, I got away with it once, and I'm going to get away with it again. I'm with my attorney, dude. And at that point, we had to terminate the interview but I had enough to know he killed Mindy. But without Mindy's body, prosecutors can charge Wade only with bank fraud. Investigators continue the frantic search for their victim. It's getting cold, leaves are dropping, and we know that if we don't find Mindy's body immediately, the snow will cover it and it will forever not be found. Six weeks after Mindy goes missing, and just as it seems Josh is once again about to get away with murder, an electric company employee discovers the remains of a woman in a wooded area more than an hour's drive from Anchorage. And so myself and the Anchorage Police Department are contacted, and then we go out on scene. They are horrified to see the body of Mindy Schloss. Mindy was laying on her back 
and she was in the middle of the woods. I thought how horrifying, how, how terrified she must have been. The forensic team does a thorough examination of the scene. Underneath her head, we found a shell casing. The shell casing was a 45 caliber Federal cartridge, same caliber as seen in the hand of Josh. With a heavy heart, Pam Pernu contacts Bob Conway. I told Pam, you know, when they did find her, to, to come to me first. And then I wanted to go see Jerry. I had a knock on the door, and it was about 11 o'clock at night. It was Bob and Pam there. And seeing them, I knew. Um, sorry. It was reality at that point. You know, you couldn't convince yourself any other way. They'd found her body. But can they prove Josh Wade is the one who murdered her? What we don't have, we weren't able to find any evidence that would put Josh at that body site. It's extremely important. So they wanted to bring the dogs back up so that we could see maybe what path Josh Wade took to take Mindy into the woods. They take the dogs to a cul-de-sac not far from where Mindy's body was discovered. It's a location where we assumed the car would have been parked. They then present the dog with scent taken directly from Josh Wade. And the dog ran onto the trail that went up to the area where Mindy's body was found and came back out to the road and ran down the road, which would have been the exit that Josh would have made in the, in the vehicle. A second dog is presented with Mindy Schloss's scent. The dog tracked from the cul-de-sac area back on the path and directly to where her body was found and then didn't do anything else. It sat down as if that's the end of the track. It was eerie. You see there was five or six police officers and FBI agents there, and everybody's silent seeing this dog walk the same path that Mindy walked and then stops right where she was killed. Can police convince Josh Wade's brand new bride to help bring him to justice? She says, I have everything. He confessed to me. But I do not want to talk to you about what I know. Investigators on the Mindy Schloss murder are slowly building their case against 27-year-old Josh Wade, who'd escaped justice years earlier for the savage killing of Della Brown. We can show that Josh used Mindy's ATM card. Josh used her car. We were able to place uh, Josh Wade at the location where Mindy's body was recovered. But investigators still have nothing that places Josh Wade at Mindy's home. We knew that Mindy was in the house on the night that she disappeared and that she was taken from her house. And it was important for us to put him in the house just to, to complete the picture of what happened. Will the DNA results from Mindy's home provide police with what they need? During the first search of Mindy's house, the crime scene team went in and they used tape lifts to basically lift up everything that was on the floor of her residence. They literally, using a, a toothpick and a tweezers, go and pull off every single hair from the tape lifts and go through the vacuum cleaner. She had a cat, so there was a lot of cat hair on those tape lifts, and I can't imagine being the examiner at the lab and determine, was, was this a cat hair? Was this a human hair? Is this just a fiber? And then having to microscopically look at them and compare them to Josh Wade's hair to see if there's any, any connection. After going through all of that, they were able to find a hair that had Josh Wade's DNA profile. We now can place Josh Wade in Mindy's house. The investigators are thrilled, and on May 18, 2008, 10 months after Mindy's disappearance, Wade is charged with her murder. But do police have a strong enough case to seek the death penalty? The fact that Wade is already in jail helps. Because he's not trying to convince people not to talk. He's not putting pressure on other people who may be a witness not to say anything to the police. Or so they think until they discover that Josh Wade had reconnected with former girlfriend Lisa, the woman who'd identified him from the ATM photo and could testify to that in court.
after he was arrested, she started visiting him at the jail. And Joshua then goes and convinces her to marry him. Which was against jail policy. He was told that he could not do it, but he did. It was so that she would not testify against him, because now she was his wife. Their jailhouse marriage is declared invalid, but not before investigators have begun to wonder what Lisa knows about Josh that he's so determined to keep secret. We went to her um, place of employment, and we sat down and talked to her. She said, yes, she married Joshua Wade, but since that's past, I don't want to have anything to do with him. I'm not going to say anything. We tried to plead to her sense of responsibility. We talked to her about she was a mom, and what would she do if this was one of her children? And Lisa still told me to, that she didn't want to talk. The following day, however. I got a phone call from our dispatch center, and they said that there's a lady named Lisa that wanted to talk to me. She says, I was thinking about what you said, and I want to tell you. She says, I have everything. He confessed to me. The investigators sit Lisa down for an interview. She told us that she and Josh had had a conversation in the jail and that Josh had told her that there was a party that was going on at the house that evening. She says that Josh, who was flat broke, decided to burglarize the home next door. He broke in. He said as he was rummaging through her things, Mindy came out of the back bedroom and surprised him. He says, I'm not going back to jail. I have a witness here that can't be a witness. Wade makes Mindy lie down on the bathroom floor, and he ties her up. Then he went home and got his gun, zip ties, the things that he would need to abduct her. He doesn't want to leave any evidence. He gets some garbage bags. He puts the garbage bags on his feet, and he tapes his feet. And then came back to Mindy still laying on the floor in the bathroom, put her into the car, laid her down in the back seat, and put a blanket over her. Then drove more than an hour outside of town and forced her to walk into the woods. He told Mindy that he was going to let her go, had her kneel down, because he told her that he was going to cut the restraints off of her. And then he kills her by pointing the gun and pulling the trigger in the back of her head. I just thought, what, what the hell she had to go through. Just a horrible night. And just such an evil guy, how he could do that to anybody. He made the bed. He vacuumed. He did everything consistent with somebody trying to hide that he was the person responsible for her death. And in the fall of 2009, two years after Mindy's murder, the hearing for Josh Wade gets underway in an Anchorage courtroom. Neither Bob Conway nor the mother of Della Brown miss a day. I got strength from her, and she probably got some strength from me. In the hopes of bringing closure to the friends and family of both victims. We told Wade that if he confessed to killing Mindy Schloss, and he also accepted responsibility for the death of Della Brown, that we would take the death penalty off the table. To the relief of Della Brown's mother, Wade agrees to the plea deal. Well, the important thing was that she finally got him to admit that, you know, that he did kill her daughter. And it was just, it was a huge relief to her. I could see that. It was big for both of us. Accordingly, I sentence Mr. Wade to a term of 99 uh, years without the possibility of ever being released uh, for the remainder of his natural life. 1987, Kansas City, Missouri. An 89-year-old grandmother is assaulted and strangled to death in her own home. The murder itself was very violent, very brutal. There was a lot of blood on the carpet. The case goes cold within months, and for 16 years, the killer remains at large. I didn't want it to ever become a cold case that just never got solved. Will new technology unleash the secrets of this old evidence? The whole evening, I was pacing, wondering who it could be, who it could be. She was really looking for that needle in the haystack. Can investigators finally put the fiend behind bars? He became 
very, very violent. The fact that he would have been out there as a predator is scary. It's scary for all of us. Kansas City, a place that Edna Walton has called home since the 1940s. She was a strong woman, very independent. She liked the fact that she had a house and that she had uh, purchased it herself. In 1987, at the age of 89, Edna Walton still lives proudly in the snug bungalow that her grandson Lawson so fondly remembers from his boyhood. One thing that stands out in my mind about my grandmother was right when you first came in the door, she'd give you big hugs, and it was uh, to the point that it would hurt. She always wore bright red lipstick, so when you ended up with the lipstick all over your cheek. With all of her family living out of town, Edna's mainstay is her friend, David Nogar. She always would give me advice and tell me, don't you stay out? too late, don't you drink too much, don't you run around with the wrong people. Small things like that made me feel a great affection for her. As the years pass, Edna's family relies increasingly on David to keep an eye on the senior. When Edna became older and older, her daughter Betty would, you know, do you mind looking in? And I, I never did. He actually called her on a daily basis just to see how she was doing, make sure everything was OK. But it's not unusual for Edna to miss a call. She was getting a little bit deaf. And you could hear the TV on the street when you would go to her house. When Edna didn't answer the phone, I would run over. A good safety check, because outside Edna's front door, the community is changing. It was the beginning of the drug era, and there were unsavory people in the neighborhood. It was just an area in decline. For my parents, it was a bit of a concern. But armed with her billy club, Edna refuses to be afraid, even after a late night break-in. Two men came into the house, and she woke up, and they were standing at the end of her bed. And she started screaming and howling at them, and she chased them out of the house. She was feisty. She was feisty. The senior said nothing about the incident to her family. Edna did not want to be moved out of her home. She loved it there, and she just was not going to leave, no matter what. She felt capable of, of dealing with anything that was in front of her, so. On August 26, 1987, David Nogar makes his daily call to Edna. The phone rang and rang and rang. He heads over to check on her. But as he approaches Edna's home, the hair on the back of his neck stands on end. When I didn't hear the television in Edna's house, I knew something was wrong. And I walked up the steps slowly. The door was open a few inches. Once inside, Nogar makes a horrific discovery. There was a lot of blood on the carpet, and Edna was on the floor. It looked as if she'd been beat. Sexually assaulted and strangled to death. I went over and felt her, and she was cold. The fan had caught some of the blood. It was just very eerie. I then called the police. For investigators, the crime scene tells a chilling story. There were droplets of blood in the dining room, and then um, going into the living room, it appears that Miss Edna kept backing away from her attacker, but she wasn't able to escape. And it was very near her front door where she she eventually died. 
The details of that death are heartbreaking. Miss Edna had multiple injuries, but she died of um, manual strangulation, so she had a broken jaw and a broken neck. She was, um, I'm quite sure, um, fighting until the very end. Edna's family is devastated. I don't know how to describe the feeling. It was very overwhelming. Your grandmother's dead. You start questioning who might have done it, why they did it, what was their motive. Detectives find no evidence of a robbery. She had a social security check in her purse. Her house had not been ransacked. And even the watch and ring on her finger was still in place. And there are no signs of forced entry to the home. Miss Edna's assailant came in through the front door and probably was allowed in. She always kept her front door locked and was always look out to make sure she knew who was there. So you start thinking about who had access to the house, who would she have let in. The police take a hard look at David Nogar. It is certainly not uncommon for the person that, that alerts the police to be linked to the crime in some way. They made me sit down on the sofa, and they wouldn't cover up the body, or and so I had to sit there until the coroner came. A strategic effort to put more pressure on Nogar. It became clear to him that he was a suspect. It is close to midnight by the time police finally take him to the station for an interview. Detectives would come in and question me for 10 or 15 minutes, and then leave for maybe five or 10 minutes, and then a different detective would come in and question me. And this went on all night. David Nogar is fingerprinted and forced to provide a hair sample before being released, at least for now. He was just too close to the family and made no sense. Back at the crime scene, detectives continue their search for evidence. Tape lifting is just basically using a two-inch white tape to gently pat down surfaces at a crime scene. It's used routinely to collect loose trace evidence, such as hairs, fiber. Police also gather evidence from Edna's body, including loose hair strands. While most appear to be hers, 14 hairs were actually identified as foreign to Edna Walton. Hairs likely shed by the killer during the assault on the senior. In 1987, the technology that was available really for hair analysis was primarily microscopic comparison. So looking at an unknown hair from a crime scene and comparing it to the suspect. Will the hairs be a match to David Nogar? The suspect is going to be in your case within the first 24 hours. Or might Edna's brutal killer remain in the shadows forever? I didn't want it to ever become a cold case that just never got solved. Edna Walton, an 89-year-old grandmother, has been assaulted and murdered in her own home. Her close friend, David Nogar, a suspect in her brutal slay. To me, it was unbelievable. They took samples of hair. But will it match the strands left by the killer on Edna Walton's body? We're magnifying anywhere from 100 to 400 times the features in the hair. Before the day is done, the lab has an answer. We were able to determine that David Nogar was excluded as a potential donor of that hair in Edna Walton's case. I felt a sense of relief. David just was too close to my grandmother to have had anything to do with it. In fact, the foreign strands gathered at the crime scene bear no resemblance to those of David Nogar. The hair itself had characteristics that were typical of African Americans. They realized that the person that had done it was a black male. The news heats up a simmering investigation. The police went door to door trying to ask um, neighbors, did they see anything? But Edna's home was surrounded by bushes and trees, and the senior had little interaction with the community outside her door. But she did know the woman next door because they would see each other in the yard and borrow things from each other. The neighbor's name is Wanda Tillman. 
but she and her husband, Marshall Tillman, had moved away weeks before the murder. However, Mr. Tillman still came and went a bit from that home. He was coming back to the house daily to get his mail. In fact, Tillman tells police he was at his old house the day of the murder, but he saw nothing unusual next door. Nor, it seems, did others in Edna's neighborhood. The police interview anyone and everyone connected to Edna. It was becoming apparent that the police weren't, weren't finding anything. Edna Walton's family wanted to know who murdered her. So it was very frustrating. You just continually think about it. What possibly you've missed or forgotten? Is there something the police could check out? I didn't want it to ever become a cold case that just never got solved. Months go by and then years, but Edna's family and friends refuse to forget. I would call the police department and ask if they had any new leads, are they still working on it? And just, just try to let them know that there were people still out there that cared. Every time I would see a murder of similar circumstances, I would immediately call the police to the point where they told me not to call anymore. In 2002, 15 years after Edna's murder, Lawson sees something on a cop show that gives him hope, DNA profiling. You know, you're just grasping at straws and DNA sounded like the next, uh, the next straw to grasp at. He contacts police yet again. I received a phone call when I was working the night shift. We got a lot of phone calls from people who were interested in having us look at their family's older cases that didn't have the benefit of the DNA. But this call will be pivotal in reviving the investigation. Sergeant Eckert is very tenacious. No one had picked up that case for, for several years. So the next day, Sergeant Eckert digs up the old paperwork from homicide storage. I had Lawson send me a picture of her because I had no image of who I was dealing with. Edna's case strikes a chord. It did become personal. I think it's because of Edna's age. She was a grandmother. She loved her family. She loved her grandkids. She was a very independent woman. Sergeant Eckert carefully reviews the original investigation. In all my homicide training, we're told that the suspect is going to be in your case within the first 24 hours. It's entirely possible that the original detectives had unknowingly been face to face with Edna's killer. Without the ability to test the DNA, everyone in that case file was still a person of interest because they hadn't been able to rule anyone out. Can Eckert build on the work of the original detectives and accomplish what they could not? There were several people in and out of Edna's life. She had some fresh cut trees in her yard, so they knew that she had someone come and do yard work for her. When officers canvassing the neighborhood happened upon the gardener... He ran from them. When someone runs from you, there's a reason they're running. They apprehended the man and took him in for questioning. He denied any involvement in the offense. He had a warrant, which is why he ran. And once he cooperated with them, he was never considered a suspect any further. Then, investigators learned that only weeks before her death, Edna had, for the second time, found an intruder in her home. The encounter quickly turned violent, but Edna's wits saved her. She told him, oh, it's my heart, my heart, and he then ran out of the house. I wondered if the man had come back and had murdered Edna. Edna had told this family friend that she knew this man by a first name. William was probably no more than a boy. She felt he was probably about 15, 16 years old. Edna had indicated might have lived a block or two away. Investigators had combed the neighborhood. But they never had any luck finding out who this William was. Within months. The case went cold because they had followed up every lead. And with no DNA available at that point, there was nothing else they could do. Can DNA now give new life to the cold case? To find out, investigators must first track down the hair strands left on Edna's body by her attacker a decade and a half earlier. 
Evidence that was collected in 1987 is stored and preserved in our evidence property warehouse. Or so they hope. My first concern was whether or not we still had the property. And without that property, this case was going no further than it already had. And Edna's vicious killer would remain at large. The fact that he would have been out there as a predator is scary. It's scary for all of us. In 2002, 15 years after the savage assault and strangulation of Edna Walton, Sergeant Barbara Eckert hopes to create a DNA profile of the killer. But she knows that might well be impossible. This case occurred in 1987, and any number of things could have happened to that evidence. And that was the big question. Did they still have the evidence, and could they get DNA? Sergeant Eckert contacts forensics expert Linda Netzel basically to inquire as to whether or not there were any samples that we might be able to run DNA analysis on. There has been incidents in the past when we've gone to look for property and then it's not been found. It's either been released or destroyed for whatever reason. You're dealing with literally 500,000 pieces of evidence in that warehouse at any given time. To investigators' relief, everything still remained in property. I found the hairs that were collected from the victim's body at the crime scene. Should we get DNA profile, it was, it was pretty profound that this would be who our suspect was. So then the, the question became, how quickly can we test it? And you know, what's, what's next? As investigators are about to find out, the future of this cold case depends on the past. In 1987, hairs were essentially mounted in a semi-permanent medium. And removing them would be no easy task. First, Netzel soaks the slide. To help break down that glue that has hardened over that time frame and loosen the slide cover so that you can remove the hairs. Then she scrapes the glue from the hair strands because that material will definitely interfere with obtaining a DNA result. And as if that's not challenging enough, these hairs may not provide sufficient root tissue for a DNA profile. Most hairs that we find at a crime scenes are naturally fallen, so there's very little root tissue that's on those samples, and that's primarily what we were dealing with in Edna Walton's homicide. Little wonder investigators aren't holding their breath. Then the DNA results come in. The good news is we did get a full genetic profile of an unknown male. A profile that surely belongs to Edna Walton's killer. Linda Netzel submits the profile to the National DNA Database of Known Offenders. But to her profound disappointment, we did not obtain a hit. The person I was looking for had not yet been arrested and his DNA had not been taken. You start having some hope. Then when they found out that there were no DNA matches, it just was another step back down. But Barbara Eckert refuses to give up. I truly believe that the person who had killed Edna had killed someone else, and we just hadn't associated the two cases. So Eckert returns to the file room and makes it her mission to pour through cold cases. I was looking for other homicide cases to match Edna, which would be an elderly female who had been killed inside their residence with no signs of forced entry. There was so much shoe leather type detective work that was involved pulling these old case files literally from dusty warehouse space and getting these files out and going through them. And you have to go through them page by page and look at every case and try to see which cases match your criteria. There were literally thousands of cold cases. Every day I would pull a case and look it over and I was doing this as well as working current homicides. So this was what I did in my free time. And though months of research turn up nothing. We talked a lot during that period of time. And that was kind of my role to keep kind of pushing things along. Knowing that, that I had a responsibility to them, that's what kept me going. Finally, in July 2003, 
Six months into her search, Sergeant Eckert finds a case with grisly parallels to the Edna Walton murder. I thought they were very similar, eerily similar. When I contacted Linda and told Linda the similarities, I think she was as excited as I was. I, I was just blown away. It was an elderly woman. She had been murdered in her home. And that case had not been solved either. This time, the victim was 82-year-old Connie Tyndall. She, too, had been sexually assaulted before being killed. The murder itself was very violent, very brutal. Connie died from strangulation as well as blunt force trauma, where she was beat severely. And not only did she live less than 10 miles from Edna. In Connie's case, there was no sign of forced entry, so she had also let someone in. Might Connie Tyndall's visitor have also had a hand in Edna Walton's murder? I saw the brutality of it, and I felt that this was not a one-time incident. For over six months, Sergeant Barbara Eckert has been combing through cold case files in search of Edna Walton's killer. I truly believed this person had committed other crimes just as heinous and that we just hadn't caught him. Now, she's come across the 1989 case of Connie Tyndall, it's chillingly similar. It was an elderly woman who was strangled and beat inside her home. The prime suspect in that investigation, one Michael Gorman. At the time, the detectives felt strongly enough that they were able to get him charged. He was arrested based on the fact that his fingerprint was on the victim's phone. But that was something Gorman had been able to explain away. He had dated her granddaughter. Once the prosecutor reviewed the case, they felt that they didn't have enough to hold him because of the fact that he did have a reason to be in her house. To the dismay of investigators at the time, Gorman walked away from the charges. But if he had in fact murdered Connie Tyndall, I thought he could be responsible for killing Edna. Eckert runs his name through the computer and to her shock. I saw that he had been questioned in another homicide case. And that was a homicide that involved Christina Williams. Michael Gorman was connected to Christina Williams because he was the person last known to have seen her alive. Unlike Edna Walton and Connie Tyndall, both in their 80s, Christina Williams was just 24 when she was assaulted and murdered. She was found dead in a park and she'd been shot. Once I reviewed the case and I saw the brutality of it, I felt that this was not a one-time incident. Eckert is convinced that Gorman is responsible for the murders of both Tyndall and Williams. To prove it, the team must once again look to the past. In the 1980s, it was routine if the detectives had a suspect for them to collect hair standards. But without the benefit of DNA testing, police at the time couldn't be sure that the hairs found on the bodies of Connie Tyndall and Christina Williams belonged to Michael Gorman. Will modern day science now reveal once and for all Gorman's innocence or guilt? We were all excited and she's running the DNA and, and of course it takes a couple months. In the meantime, Sergeant Eckert assigns Detective Ray Lenore to follow up on Michael Gorman. We were given the task of locating him and getting him in for an interview. They find him at his home. We asked him if he would accompany us to the homicide unit, and he did. Ray's a really good interviewer. He raised a bulldog. He will come at you quietly, but he'll keep coming. Lenore begins by asking Gorman about his relationship with Connie Tyndall. Tell me, because you said you did a few jobs there for Miss Tyndall. Michael Gorman had sort of a relationship with Connie Tyndall to the extent that he had done odd jobs around the house. So it was conceivable that his prints and other DNA belonging to him would be in that house. But if the strands of hair found on Tyndall's body do turn out to be Gorman's. Could you have hugged her just because she was an old lady that you liked and that you cared something about? Yeah. Nothing like that? I respected that. I understand yeah. that. But no, no physical contact. He said that there was no way that his, his DNA would be on her. What was the closest that you ever got to him? I mean, when you were there in the house working, at least were, were you actually in the same? Passing by or sitting on a you know, chair or something, just passing by. 
Lenore's partner then questions Gorman about victim Christina Williams. Do you know Christina Williams? No, I don't. Do you know anyone by the name of Tina from back then? No, I don't. Did you ever use narcotics with this woman? Never. Don't even know her. Incoming lab results in both cases say otherwise. Michael Gorman's DNA was found to be on Connie Tyndall, as well as on Christina Williams. Evidence enough to charge Gorman with both their murders. But what about Edna Walton? Will the hair found on her body also prove a match to Michael Gorman? I thought I had it. I mean, it was I was kind of a little euphoria there, thinking, OK, I've got him now. But her optimism is short-lived. We contact Sergeant Eckert, of course, and let her know that Michael Gorman, he does not match the evidence from the Edna Walton homicide. I hadn't found the killer of Edna. The silver lining. I was able to determine who killed Connie and also who killed Christine. Sergeant Eckert's work led to an absolute answer in two homicides was very satisfying. With Gorman safely behind bars, Eckert focuses once again on Edna Walton's murder. Just in time for that investigation to take a shocking new turn. Those detectives in 87 had him the whole time and never realized it. In investigating Edna Walton's homicide, Sergeant Barbara Eckert has inadvertently caught another killer. I was very disappointed that I hadn't found who killed Edna, but at the same time, I was very glad to clear two more homicide cases. Relentless, Sergeant Eckert returns to the dusty files once again, determined that this time she will find Edna's killer. She was really looking for that needle in the haystack. I went through 44 cases and did not find anything. I don't think give up is a part of Sergeant Eckert's uh, profile. Every couple months, I would call Lawson and let him know what was going on. Our biggest ally was the police department. Barbara was on top of it, taking it seriously and still pursuing it. It's disappointing to call the family and tell them you haven't found the person who killed their loved one yet. Nearly a year goes by. And though Eckert seems no closer to identifying Edna Walton's assailant, the CODIS database keeps up the quest for a match to the DNA left behind by the killer. Every time new samples are put in from convicted offenders, the computer continues to search. But are investigators waiting in vain? You start to wonder, is this person that committed the offense dead, this case might never be resolved. Then on October 14, 2004, 16 years after Edna's murder, we get a phone call from the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. And it is their DNA supervisor who's notifying us that there has been a match. Linda called me at home to tell me that we had had a DNA hit, and I was just, I was speechless. The match is to an inmate serving time in the state of Kansas, but... We did not know yet who that offender was. They had to confirm it first. And that confirmation process involves pulling the convicted offender's DNA sample and rerunning it to verify that it is, in fact, the same person. So you'd think waiting 24 to 48 hours is not that big of a deal, but it really was that we were very anxious to get the name. I couldn't wait till I got the confirmation. I was shaking like I'd had too much coffee. The whole evening I was pacing, wondering who it could be, who it could be, and what has he done since. The following day, investigators get their answers. He was in custody in Kansas on a, a rape charge of a juvenile. Even though the girl died from an asthma attack shortly after the assault, her assailant was convicted only of sexual assault and sentenced to 12 years. His DNA finally entered into CODIS when the database was expanded to include sexual offenders. Now, to investigators' alarm... We were told that the offender was due to be released fairly soon. 
putting the could-be killer back on the streets where he's at risk of disappearing for good. His name, Marshall Tillman. I told her, I, I know that name. That name is somewhere in one of these cases. I could hear the keyboard. She was pounding away on the keyboard, looking him up. As Eckert quickly discovers, Marshall Tillman lived next door to Edna and was interviewed in the days following the senior's death. Once I found out it was the next door neighbor, I was flabbergasted. I mean, no one suspected him. Two years after taking on the case, Eckert makes the long-awaited phone call. I remember it was just a rainy day where I was driving down the road and I answered the phone just like you do any other day and she said that they'd found the DNA match. When I told him that the DNA hit had been to Marshall Tillman, um, he was just speechless. I don't know how to describe the feeling. I was crying at one point in time. They just kind of brought everything back fresh. He just couldn't believe that someone that he had trusted and associated with was responsible for his grandmother's death. He came over to the house to pay his respects. I was shocked to think that anyone would be so brazen, so cold-hearted to come over and give their condolences for someone he had murdered. The biggest question um, left in the minds of this family was why? This is an 89-year-old woman, and at the time, Marshall Tillman was 35. Why would he do the things that he did? In their effort to find out, detectives tracked down Marshall Tillman's ex-wife. Wanda Tillman was terrified, absolutely terrified of her ex-husband. Can investigators convince her to talk? In 2004, 16 years after the slaying of Edna Walton, a DNA profile has pointed detectives to her suspected killer, Marshall Tillman. Once I found out it was the next door neighbor, I was flabbergasted. I mean, no one suspected him. Before confronting Tillman, who's due for release from prison in less than a month, investigators want to learn all they can about him, including what might have been his motive for murdering Edna. They begin by seeking out his ex-wife, Wanda Tillman. She had been divorced from Marshall for a long time, and we got the impression that she had been hiding. She was very upset that we had found her. She kept asking us, how did you find me? How did you find me? Because she believed that if we had found her, then he could find her. When we told her that we had a DNA hit and that Marshall is the person who had killed Edna, she broke down. She became shaking, crying, extremely upset. And she said to us, I always thought he was responsible. So why hadn't she come forward? I believe Wanda was terrified of him. He had abused her throughout their whole marriage. But the situation worsened when Marshall got involved with illegal drugs. He started using PCP, and he became very, very violent. That violence continued to escalate. Wanda finally left her husband. But in the days prior to Edna's murder, she came back to check in on the elderly neighbor. She actually had a vase that she had borrowed from Edna and was going to return it. That's when Edna told Wanda that Marshall was squatting at their old house, even though the utilities had been shut down. He didn't have any water in the house next door, and Marsha was hooking and stealing water from Edna's spigot outside. And Edna told Wanda that she was going to confront him. And Wanda told Edna, don't, don't say anything to him. But the feisty senior was not one to back down that she paid for it with her life. Mr. Tillman did threaten her, but Edna did not elaborate on what the threat was. Edna did say that if it happens again, she would call the police. Wanda truly believes that Marshall, with his um, outrageous anger control problem, lost it, and that's when he killed Edna. Sergeant Eckert prepares to confront Edna's killer. It made me very angry to think that she probably trusted this neighbor and that he, you know, did this to her. It was, it was upsetting. She was ready to, to get her crew together. I contacted my detective, Ray Lenore. 
and the two travel from Missouri to a correctional facility in Kansas. When you have victims like Edna Walton, they are very vulnerable victims, so you feel compelled to do the extra, to do more, I think. Eckert is keen to come face to face with the man she has been hunting. In the normal course of events, I would never be in the interrogation room, but I had to be in the room with this one. I needed to be there, so I went in with the camera. The prisoner and his guards are not far behind. So when Tillman comes in the room, um, he's a big guy. Lenore opens the interview with routine questions. His name, his age, some of his experiences. You're a sergeant. You're honorably discharged. How much time do you spend in the room? Five years. As for the time he had left in custody, that was almost up. He was talking about making preparations for what he would do when he got out of jail. You gonna buy a car and you get out of Saving up some money? I'm trying. <laughs> He was quite um, cocky, I would say. And seems to have no idea why investigators are there. The reason he incented to talk to me to the degree that he did is because he wanted to see what it was I had to say. What is the purpose of you being here? Well, we'll get into it. At the back of his mind, he had to know that he killed this woman years and years ago. This case that you were initially contacted on, it's a 1987 case. 1987? Almost right away, you get a sense that he's a certain amount of shrewdness. He thought he had his hand on it and he had gotten away with it. Then Lenore cuts to the chase. And, uh, well, never mind. I saw him talking to you about it. He got real quiet and he got kind of still. I could see his demeanor change. I mean, he's, his, his whole countenance just kind of dropped. You're not willing to talk to us about that no more. And he said, I'm done talking. And that was it. He shut down. He actually pushed back away from the table and didn't want to talk to me anymore, refused to talk to me anymore. We alerted the people there in the jail that we were done. But this is just the beginning of a long road to trial. As police prepare to lay charges against Tillman, he prepares to dispute their evidence. His claim was that we had somehow mistaken his DNA with the DNA that we found on Edna Walton. Can a simple swab settle the DNA debate once and for all? And he thrashed about moving his head around. He had to be taken to the floor. 16 years after the vicious murder of Edna Walton, police believe they have finally found her killer, Marshall Tillman the man who'd lived in the house next door to the 89-year-old. Made me very angry to think that she probably trusted this neighbor and that he did this to her. DNA from hair strands left on Edna's body by the man who assaulted and murdered her is a perfect match to Marshall Tillman, but that doesn't stop him from insisting he's innocent. His claim was that we had somehow mistaken his DNA with the DNA that we found on, on Edna Walton. The courts demand that Tillman provide a new DNA sample. The investigators know they need to get it from him fast. Marshall was due to be released in just a few weeks. This man, likely a brutal killer, could be back on the street. I obtained a, a search warrant from a Jackson County Circuit Judge to get a buckle swab, a DNA sample from Marshall Tillman. A buckle swab is a cotton swab, and they rub it around their cheek and, and gum area. But will Tillman comply? I presented him with the search warrant, and he told me then that he had no intentions of consenting to give the swab. So at that point, we restrained him. He continued to resist to the, to the extent that he had to be taken to the floor. And he thrashed about, moving his head around, and we finally held his head steady, and I inserted the swabs into his mouth. But even investigators are shocked at what happens next. Marshall bit down on these wooden sticks and snapped them in half. He spat it out on the floor. Contaminating them so they were no good for us to use. Can Tillman hold out long enough to ensure he's released from prison before investigators can lay murder charges? 
Well, at that point, we had to go before a judge and get a court order. Although he is forced to submit a sample. He wanted a, a private agency to do it. He didn't trust the police. An independent person did the swabbing of his cheeks and put it in the container and then handed it to Ray. The results are not surprising. Once those swabs were tested, it was confirmed that Marshall was the killer of Edna Walton. Despite that evidence, he refuses to own up to his crime. Marshall Tillman pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. In February of 2008, Marshall Tillman is tried in a Jackson County courtroom. Edna's grandson, Lawson, doesn't miss a day. I always felt his presence, you know, behind me. You've been dealing with this for years, and now you finally have the person who they think did it in court and you're sitting there looking at this person 10, 15 feet in front of you. It was really, really difficult for him, very difficult. Especially given the arguments Tillman's legal team puts forward. The defense's case still kind of angers me that Miss Edna um, very possibly fell down, causing her own injuries, uh, breaking her own neck, and that she killed herself. <laughs> A preposterous tale in light of the evidence DNA from Marshall Tillman's hair found on Edna Walton's battered body. It was very clear that this was a very brutal assault on her. There was blood on her fireplace. There was blood on a fan. There was blood on the walls. There was quite a bit of, of physical evidence there of her assault. Very good police work preserved that crime scene so that even 20 years later, we can kind of piece together what happened. A simple neighborly dispute turned tragic, though even investigators admit that's only their best guess. Two people know what happened that day, Miss Edna and the defendant, Marshall Tillman. Marshall wasn't going to tell us what happened, and so thankfully the DNA did. And after just five hours of deliberation, the jury convicts Marshall Tillman of first-degree murder. I never witnessed a moment of remorse in Marshall Tillman. He is sentenced to life in prison. It was a great relief. It was no longer this just infinite thing that you potentially were going to deal with for the rest of your life. It was finally done. I knew Edna could rest better knowing that her murderer was finally coming to justice. Miss Edna is one that you don't forget. You can't just walk away from it. You know, you remember cases like this. I look at photographs from my grandmother's house, and you evolve to a point where you look at those photos again, and you don't see the fringe of a crime scene. You see the family environment where you grew up, and those memories of the bad things that happen kind of fade away. 